Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm overclocking the AMD Radeon 780M integrated graphics of the Ryzen 7 8700G APU all the way up to 3150 megahertz using the ROG Strix X670E i motherboard and EK Quantum custom loop water cooling. Now, I've already overclocked the Ryzen 7 8700G in my previous Scatterbencher guide. However, there I only overclock the CPU cores. In today's video, we get to what I think is the most interesting part of APU overclocking, the integrated graphics. So I really couldn't wait to get started on this one and I can't wait to share all the things that I found out with you in this video. So let's get started. The Radeon 780M is not a new product from AMD as it was also integrated in the 2023 Phoenix Notebook processor lineup. For example, the Ryzen 9 7940HS already featured this integrated graphics. On the desktop side, the Radeon 780M is only available in the Ryzen 7 8700G APU. The Ryzen 7 8700G is the flagship processor of AMD's Zen 4 based Ryzen 8000 desktop APU product line codenamed Hawkpoint. The Hawkpoint processors were announced on January 8, 2024. A key difference between the Ryzen 7000 CPUs and the Ryzen 8000G APUs is that the former is a multi-chiplet based design and the latter features a single monolithic die. What's also exciting about the Ryzen 8000G processors is that it's the first AMD desktop products manufactured using the TSMC N4 process. Technically speaking, I guess Hawkpoint is the successor to the 2021 Cezanne APU, better known as the Ryzen 5000G processors. I overclocked the direct predecessor of the 8700G, the 5700G in Scatterbencher number 24, where I covered both CPU core and graphics overclocking. With the Radeon 780M integrated graphics, AMD finally brings the RDNA 3.0 architecture to the APU, as the integrated graphics for the Ryzen 7000 processors was still the RDNA 2.0 architecture. This will in fact be the first time that I'm overclocking the RDNA 3 architecture as the last AMD discrete graphics card I overclocked was the Radeon RX 6500 XT in Scatterbencher number 41. AMD announced the RDNA 3 graphics architecture on November 4, 2022 during their Together We Advance gaming event. About a month later, the first RDNA 3 products entered the market with the Radeon RX 7900 XT and XTX, both featuring the Navi 31 chiplet. With the RX 7800 XT and RX 7600, AMD would later introduce Navi 32 and Navi 33. Compared to RDNA 2, AMD claims a 17% IPC improvement and combined with the higher clocks and increased CU count, that translates in a 54% generational performance uplift. RDNA 3 also features the second generation array accelerators and a bunch of other architectural improvements. The Radeon 780M has six work group processors or WGPs with a total of 12 compute units or CUs and 12 array accelerators. That's significantly less than the entry-level Radeon RX 7600 discrete graphics, which features 16 workgroup processors. The maximum GPU frequency is 2.9 GHz, the TDP is 65 Watt, and the TJ Max is 95 degrees Celsius. In this video, I am covering five different overclocking strategies. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. The benchmark selection is similar to the one we used in our other GPU scatterbencher guides. To add some points of clarification, for AI benchmark, I rely again on the TensorFlow DirectML library. I use the 3DMark FSR feature test to measure the impact of overclocking on the performance improvements between FSR off and FSR on. 
For stress testing, I include two workloads, the 3DMark Speedway stress test as a proxy for a gaming workload and the OCCT 3D standard workload as a worst case scenario. Before starting overclocking, however, we need to check what the performance is like at stock settings. The default precision boost two parameters for the Radeon 780M are as follows. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. When running the 3DMark Speedway stability test, the average GPU effective clock is 2881 MHz with 1.085 volts. The GPU memory clock is 2400 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 50 watts. When running the OCCT 3D standard stress test, the average GPU effective clock is 2476 MHz with 0.947 volts. The GPU memory clock is 2400 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 69 watts. In our first overclocking strategy, we simply enable Precision Boost Overdrive and enable AMD Expo. Precision Boost Overdrive 2 is AMD's proprietary overclocking toolkit, which enables customers to fine tune the parameters governing the Precision Boost 2 algorithm. It's mostly used for CPU core overclocking, but it can also be used to overclock the integrated graphics. With the launch of Zen 3, AMD introduced an improved version of the Precision Boost Overdrive toolkit, allowing for manual tuning of even more parameters affecting the Precision Boost frequency boosting algorithm. There are essentially three levels of Precision Boost Overdrive. By enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, we rely on the motherboard pre-programmed PBO parameters. We find that the following values have changed. Increasing the PPT and to a lesser extent the TDC and EDC limit will help unleash the frequency and extreme workloads previously limited by the power limits. Unlocking the power limits can really make this little APU scream, especially in perhaps unrealistic workloads where we stress the CPU cores and the integrated graphics at the same time. Expo stands for AMD Extended Profiles for Overclocking. It's an AMD technology that enables ubiquitous memory overclocking profiles for AMD platforms supporting DDR5 memory. Expo allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance settings onto the memory sticks. If the motherboard supports Expo, you can enable higher performance with a single BIOS setting. As we'll see later on in this video, unlocking the memory performance is a key part of APU Intergraphics performance tuning. Upon entering the BIOS, switch to the Advanced Mode view and stay in the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo 1. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Enabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. Unlocking the power limits and enabling higher memory performance has a significant impact on the performance of the integrated graphics. The GeoMean performance improvement is plus 16% and we get a maximum improvement of plus 26.32% in Tomb Raider. When running the 3DMark Speedway stability test, the average GPU effective clock is 2,903 MHz with 1.063 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3,200 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 69 watts. When running the OCCT 3D standard stress test, the average GPU effective clock is 2,882 MHz with 1.141 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3,200 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 138 watts. In the second overclocking strategy, we try to tune the Precision Boost 2 boosting algorithm using the Precision Boost Overdrive 2 toolkit. GPU Boost Clock Override is one of the overclocking tools available in the PBO2 toolkit. It allows the user to override the arbitrary clock frequency limit up to plus 200 MHz in steps of 25 MHz. When we increase the GPU Boost Clock Limit by 200 MHz, the new GPU Boost IFMAX is 3100 MHz. Curve Optimizer allows end users to fine tune the voltage frequency temperature curve of their APU. Now, the VFT curve defines the relationship between a frequency and a temperature and the voltage that is required to run that frequency at that temperature. 
Obviously, if the frequency is higher or the temperature is higher, then you'll need more voltage. Many parts inside your CPU have a VFT curve, but unfortunately we can only fine tune the curve for each of the eight CPU cores and the integrated graphics. GFX Curve Optimizer adjusts the VFT curve of the integrated graphics by offsetting the voltages of the factory fused VFT curve. By setting a positive offset, you increase the voltage point. Conversely, you decrease the voltage point by setting a negative offset. Experienced Ryzen overclockers are undoubtedly extremely familiar with how Curve Optimizer works. And GFX Curve Optimizer works kind of similarly, but not quite identical. Before I show you how you can use it, I want to explain a little bit about three AMD technologies, AVFS, BTC, and VAO. Since the 2015 Carrizo APU, AMD has used Adaptive Voltage Frequency Scaling, or AVFS, in short. The long story short is that AMD adds replica paths to the circuit that serve no other purpose than to assess whether the circuit is stable or not. The AVFS technology infers the stability of the real paths using sampling statistics. This statistical data is then used by the SMU to create a voltage frequency temperature table. The VFT table is a part-specific lookup table with information on the optimal voltage for any combination of frequency and voltage. AMD employs a boot time calibration process to fine tune this voltage on each system. Essentially, during the boot process, the chip checks the quality of the power delivery. Based on the quality, it then offsets the factory fused VFT table. If you have a greater power supply, the offset will be smaller. If you have a terrible power supply, then the offset will be greater. Despite having all of these incredible technologies like AVFS, B2C, T2P voltage offset, a VFT table, AMD cannot predict what will happen in the real world. Sometimes the voltage droop under transient loads is so high that the voltage gets too low and the system crashes. Fortunately, AMD also has a technology called voltage adaptive operation, more commonly known as clock stretching. The technology consists of two circuits. One circuit serves as a configurable droop detector and the second circuit functions as a configurable digital frequency synthesizer. The effect is simple. If a voltage droop is detected, the effective clock frequency is lowered to ensure continuous operation instead of a system crash. The clock frequency is determined by the configured target frequency, which often is based on a reference clock and multiplier. It is usually the GPU frequency you'll see in applications like GPU-Z. The effective clock frequency is the total clock cycles between two moments. This determines the actual performance as work gets done with each clock cycle. We can easily check the effective clock frequency with tools like Hardware Info. AMD GPUs heavily rely on this voltage adaptive operation to maximize the frequency at a given voltage level. You'll find that in heavier workloads, where usually you have a little bit more voltage droop, that the effective clock is slightly lower than in the lighter workloads. In some cases, we can take advantage of this technology. For example, with the Radeon RX 6500 XT, we overvolted the GPU, which caused the effective clock to be higher than the set target clock. We could reach 3 GHz effective clock with a 2975 MHz set clock. Remember this as we'll get back to it later in the video. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that the GPU performance is closely tied to the effective voltage level. Using GFX Curve Optimizer, we can fine tune those GAR bands and try to squeeze a little bit more effective clock out of our GPU. Just a couple of minutes ago, I gave you the example how we overvolted the Radeon RX 6500 XT to get a little bit higher effective clock. And that's what we'll try to do as well with the GFX Curve Optimizer. It's very counterintuitive for experienced Ryzen CPU overclockers, but bear with me. When we set a positive GFX Curve Optimizer setting, we're telling the graphics core it requires more voltage for a specific VF point. The voltage supply will then increase the voltage accordingly, and the voltage adaptive operation technology will match the voltage with the appropriate maximum frequency. 
the effect is a higher effective clock frequency at a given target clock frequency, but it's only a small difference. So at the end of the day, this GFX curve optimizer tool isn't really that useful for the Radeon 780M integrated graphics. Expo Tweaked is another option available in the AI Overclock Tuner function. It is pretty much the same like Expo 1 or Expo 2, but applies the memory timings slightly differently. Expo Tweaked will load the complete Expo profile, and then the motherboard will make further adjustments to the various primary and secondary timings if possible. Since memory performance significantly impacts the performance of the integrated graphics, I decided to just try Expo Tweaked and see if it works. And it did, so that's the setting I went with. Upon entering the BIOS, switch to the advanced mode view and stay in the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to Expo Tweaked. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the AMD Overclocking submenu. Click Accept. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set GPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled. Set Max GPU Boost Clock Override to 200 MHz. Enter the GFX Curve Optimizer submenu. Set GFX Curve Optimizer to GFX Curve Optimizer. Set GFX Curve Optimizer Sign to Positive. Set GFX Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 50. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. With only a slightly higher frequency of 200 MHz, we didn't expect too much of a performance improvement. Compared to the previous OC strategy, the GeoMean performance improves by 3.5 percentage points. We get the highest performance improvement over stock of plus 28.95% in Tomb Raider. When running the 3 Mark Speedway stability test, the average GPU effective clock is 3099 MHz with 1.2 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3200 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 83 watts. When running the OCCT 3D standard stress test, the average GPU effective clock is 3053 MHz with 1.2 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3200 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 159 watts. In the third overclocking strategy, I pursue a manual overclock. That means that I'll be trying to adjust the frequency of all the parts that may impact the APU graphics performance, including the F clock, the U clock, the M clock, and obviously the GFX clock. But before I show you my settings, I want to take a couple of minutes and go through the hog point clocking and voltage topology, as understanding those two parts will help us better understand where the tuning opportunities lie. The clocking of hog point APUs is similar to the other Zen 4 desktop processors. The standard hog point platform has a 48 MHz crystal input to the integrated CGPLL clock generator. The CGPLL then generates a 48 MHz clock for the USB PLL and a 100 MHz reference clock for the FCH, which contains the CCLK PLL for the CPU cores and several SOC PLLs. The CCLK PLL 100 MHz reference clock drives the 200 MHz VCO, which is then multiplied by an FID and divided by a DID. As a whole, this provides CPU clock frequency granularity of 25 MHz. The SOC PLLs include a wide range of PLLs present on the die. The ones most relevant for overclocking are the F clock, the U clock, the M clock, the GFX clock, and maybe the IPU clock. F clock is the term used for the infinity fabric clock frequency. The default F clock frequency is 2 GHz, but some motherboards have other rules setting it to 2400 MHz. I was able to push it to 2500 MHz. U clock is the term used for the unified memory controller clock frequency. It runs by default at the same frequency as the system memory, though motherboard auto rules may drop it to half the frequency if the system memory frequency is too high. It is relatively inflexible as it can run either at the same or half the system memory frequency. On my particular system, I could run the U clock in sync with the system memory up to DDR5 6400. M clock is the term used for the system memory clock frequency. It is by default either the same or double the memory controller frequency. 
AMD recently improved its memory overclocking capabilities and Hawkpoint APUs can run well over DDR5-8000. GFX clock is the term used for the integrated graphics core clock frequency. At stock, it will go up to 2.9 GHz during a 3D load. The graphics clock is managed by the Precision Boost algorithm even when you set a manual target frequency. IPU clock is the term used for the inference processing unit clock frequency. It should be able to go up to 1.6 GHz, however I've only seen it go up to 1028 MHz. Currently we cannot overclock the IPU. With the launch of Raphael a couple of years ago, we also got back a working e-clock mode. E-clock stands for external clock and it's exactly what the term suggests. We can use an external clock generator. In addition to the standard internal CGPLL, Hawkpoint supports up to two external clock modes. They're called E-clock 0 mode and E-clock 1 mode. In E-clock 0 mode, also referred to as synchronous mode, an external 100 MHz reference clock is used for both the CPU PLL and SOC PLLs. In other words, it's a reference clock that affects the CPU core clocks as well as the PCIe and SATA clocks. In E-clock 1 mode, also referred to as synchronous mode, there are two distinct external 100 MHz reference clocks. One clock provides the 100 MHz input to the CPU PLL, and another provides the 100 MHz reference clock for the SOC PLLs. AMD suggests up to 140 MHz can be expected for the CPU core reference clock, but your mileage may vary. At the launch of Raphael, I showed 170 MHz is even possible. The voltage topology of Hawkpoint processors is very similar to previous AMD Zen 4 based processors, with one major difference. And I got this one wrong in my previous 8700G APU overclocking guide. The processor relies on an internal and external power supply to generate the processor voltages. There are four primary power supplies from the motherboard VRM to the processor. The VDDCR voltage rail provides the external power for three internal voltage regulators. VDDCR CPU provides the voltage for the CPU cores within the CCX. The voltage rail can work in either regular or bypass mode, but on Hawkpoint it is always in bypass mode. That means the voltage of the cores is always equal to the VDDCR external voltage. The end user can then change the voltage in the BIOS. VDDCR VDDM provides the voltage for the L2, L3 and if present, 3D vCache on a CCX. This rail cannot work in bypass mode, therefore it is always internally regulated from the VDDCR external voltage rail. We can also not adjust this voltage. VDDCR GFX provides the voltage for the integrated graphics. In the past, this voltage would be provided by the VDDCR SOC voltage rail, but likely due to the high current requirements of the powerful integrated graphics, it's safer to use the typically beefier VDDCR voltage plane. The voltage plane can technically work in either regular mode or bypass mode, however I believe only regular mode is available. In regular mode, the voltage is managed by the integrated voltage regulator and derived from the VDDCR voltage rail. This voltage is limited to 1.25 volt under ambient conditions and requires LN2 mode to enable a higher range. The VDDCR SOC voltage rail provides the external power for multiple internal voltage regulators on SOC for various IP blocks, including but not limited to the memory controller, SMU, PSP and so on. It's essential to know that the VDDCR SOC voltage must always be lower than the VDDIO mem voltage plus 100 millivolt. The VDDCR SOC voltage can be set up to 1.3 volt under ambient conditions. Again, we need LN2 mode enabled for higher voltages. The VDDCR miscellaneous voltage rail provides the external power for the internally regulated VDDG voltage rail. VDDG is the voltage supply for the Infinity fabric data path. The VDDIO mem voltage rail provides the external power for the VDDP DDR internal voltage regulator. VDDP is the voltage for the DDR bus signaling or DRAM PHY, so it can help achieve higher memory frequencies. As a rule, the external VDDIO mem should always be higher than the internal VDDP DDR plus 100 millivolt. When memory overclocking, you may need to manually increase the VDDP voltage as it does not automatically adjust when changing the VDDIO memory voltage. 
Manually overclocking the Radeon 780M is pretty straightforward as it's just a trial and error process. For example, I tried a frequency higher than 2500 MHz for the Infinity Fabric Clock and it didn't work, so I had to back down to 2500 MHz. Overclocking the system memory and memory controller are tied together. In my case, I could run them in sync up to DDR5 6400. For higher frequencies, I had to reduce the U-clock to half the speed of the M-clock. Since DDR5 6800 with a 1700 MHz memory controller resulted in the best performance, that's what I stuck with. The graphics overclocking itself was very underwhelming. There are three things that we have to take into account. One, you can set a manual target boost frequency and voltage in the AMD overclocking menu. This frequency and voltage is now the target for the precision boost graphics frequency. The maximum temperature in my worst case workload is already 90.3 degrees Celsius for 3.1 gigahertz at 1.2 volt. So there's very limited thermal headroom to increase the frequency. As I mentioned already, the maximum graphics voltage is limited to 1.25 volt under ambient conditions. You can set higher in the BIOS, but it won't apply higher than 1.25 volt. So realistically, given there's almost no thermal headroom, I should just try and find what's the maximum frequency for 1.2 volt. And the maximum frequency was 3150 megahertz, only 50 megahertz more than when we use the Fmax offset. In the Speedway stress test, we have a little more thermal headroom to try the maximum voltage of 1.25 volt. A quick test revealed we could clock the graphics up to 3.3 gigahertz. That's higher than before, but still very limited headroom. Upon entering the BIOS, switch to the advanced mode view and stay in the AI tweaker menu. Set AI overclock tuner to Expo tweaked. Set memory frequency to DDR5 6800. Go to the advanced menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu. Click accept. Enter the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Set GFX clock frequency to 3150. Set GFX voltage to 1200. Leave the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Enter the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Set Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers to 2500 MHz. Set UClock Div 1 mode to UClock equals MemClock divided by 2. Leave the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Leave the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Despite the extremely small improvement in GPU core frequency, it appears we still get a bit of extra performance boost thanks to the improvements in fabric and memory frequency. Compared to the previous OC strategy, the GeoMean performance improves by 3.1 percentage points. We get the highest performance improvement over stock with plus 39.09% in AI benchmark. When running the 3DMark stability test, the average GPU effective clock is 3141 MHz with 1.2 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3400 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 84 watts. When running the OCCT 3D standard stress test, the average GPU effective clock is 3086 MHz with 1.2 volts. The GPU memory clock is 3400 MHz. The average GPU ASIC power is 156 watts. In the fourth overclocking strategy, we just overclock the CPU cores and see if it adds a little bit more performance. For, for this part, I used the settings from OC strategy number two in my previous Scatterbencher guide, which relies primarily on tuning the Precision Boost Overdrive to Toolkit. Now, I'm not going to explain all of the different settings and I go, will go straight into the BIOS because if you want to learn how to overclock the 8700G CPU cores, just go and look at the Scatterbencher number 69, which is already available on this channel. Upon entering the BIOS, Switch to the advanced mode view and stay in the AI tweaker menu. Set AI overclock tuner to Expo tweaked. Set memory frequency to DDR5 6800. Go to the advanced menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu. Click accept. 
Enter the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Set GFX clock frequency to 3150. Set GFX voltage to 1200. Leave the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Enter the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Set Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers to 2500. Set UClock Div 1 mode to UClock equals MemClock divided by 2. Leave the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Leave the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scaler Control to Manual. Set Precision Boost Overdrive Scaler to 10x. Set CPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled Positive. Set Max CPU Boost Clock Override to 200. Enter the Curve Optimizer submenu. Set Curve Optimizer to Per Core. Set Core 0 to Core 7 Curve Optimizer Sign to Negative. Now I set the Curve Optimizer for each core according to my own test result. Set Core 0, 1 and 2 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 50. Set Core 3 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 25. Set Core 4, 5 and 6 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 40. Set Core 7 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 35. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. Overclocking the CPU cores hardly improves the graphics performance of this APU. Compared to the previous OC strategy, the GeoMean performance improves by only 0.3 percentage points. We get the highest performance improvement over stock of plus 39.74% in AI benchmark. Obviously, since the graphics configuration is identical to the previous OC strategy, I didn't bother rerunning the stress tests. In the fifth and final overclocking strategy, I want to show you how extensive memory timing tuning can have a significant impact on the APU's graphics performance. And for that, I will do something that I never do in any Scatterbencher guide. I swapped out the memory. I stick with G-Scale, obviously, but instead of using the Expo 6400 kit I have on hand since the launch of Ryzen 7000, I switch to an XMP 7800 kit. We would expect that increasing the memory frequency from Expo 6400 to XMP 7800 should immediately have a major impact on performance. However, that's not really the case. The two configurations yield about the same level of performance. The biggest impact on APU performance comes not from increasing the memory frequency, but from tuning the memory timings. Now, I am not at all a DDR5 overclocking expert, so I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to use the ASUS memory presets. ASUS memory presets is an ASUS overclocking technology that helps you set the right primary and secondary timings for certain memory ICs. Essentially, you select the option and then it will automatically set the memory timings as well as the voltages. The technology was first introduced in 2012 on Z77 and has been present on select ASUS motherboards ever since. The available memory profiles differ from platform to platform. This X670EI gaming motherboard with BIOS version 2012 features no less than 14 DDR5 overclocking profiles for Hynix, Samsung and Micron ICs. For this OC strategy, I picked the Hynix 8000 profile. This automatically sets the memory primary and secondary timings. It's also best to double check if the VDD-IO, DRAM VDD and DRAM VDD-Q voltages are set correctly. Lastly, be sure to also select the right memory frequency as the memory presets only adjust the memory timings and voltages. I just want to jump in here and say that these memory timings weren't 100% stable for my system, as you can see by these uh, graphical artifacts on the screen. Now, if I would have spent more time trying to figure out which memory timing exactly is causing the issue, probably I would have been able to get it 100% stable. But this OC strategy is really just about showing how memory timing tuning can have a significant impact. Uh, I didn't really want to spend too much time uh, maximizing the performance, so to speak. Upon entering the BIOS, switch to the advanced mode view and stay in the AI tweaker menu. Set memory frequency to DDR5-7800. 
Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 8000 1.45 volt 2 by 16 gigabyte single rank. Leave the memory presets submenu. Leave the DRAM timing control submenu. Set CPU SOC voltage to auto. Set CPU VDD IO MC voltage to 1.4. Set DRAM VDD and VDDQ voltage to 1.5. Go to the advanced menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu. Click accept. Enter the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Set GFX clock frequency to 3150. Set GFX voltage to 1200. Leave the manual iGPU overclocking submenu. Enter the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Set Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers to 2500 MHz. Set UClock Div 1 mode to UClock equals MemClock divided by 2. Leave the Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers submenu. Leave the DDR and Infinity Fabric Frequency Timings submenu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Advanced. Set PBO Limits to Motherboard. Set CPU Boost Clock Override to Enabled Positive. Set Max CPU Boost Clock Override to 200. Enter the Curve Optimizer submenu. Set Curve Optimizer to Per Core. Set Core 0 to Core 7 Curve Optimizer Sign to Negative. Now I set the Curve Optimizer for each core according to my own test result. Set Core 0, 1 and 2 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 50. Set Core 3 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 25. Set Core 4, 5 and 6 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 40. Set Core 7 Curve Optimizer Magnitude to 35. Leave the Curve Optimizer submenu. Leave the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Enter the SOC Voltage submenu. Set SOC Voltage to 1300. Then save and exit the BIOS. We re-ran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. The performance improvement from tuning the memory timings is pretty spectacular and well beyond my expectations. Clearly, our integrated graphics is craving for faster memory access. Compared to the previous OC strategy, the GeoMean performance improves by more than 15 percentage points. We get the highest performance improvement over stock of plus 61.14% in Furmark 1080p. As I indicated before, these memory timings aren't 100% stable. So I don't consider this a stable configuration and therefore I didn't entertain running any stability tests. All right, let's wrap this up. I'll be honest with you, I was extremely excited to finally overclock an APU again. It's been so long. When I first got my hands on the 8700G, the first thing I wanted to do was overclock the integrated graphics. However, the BIOS wasn't quite ready, so I had to postpone this part. Hence why it's later than the Scatterbencher guide where I overclocked the CPU cores of the 8700G. When I finally got to overclocking the integrated graphics, the result was a little bit underwhelming we only got it up to 3,150 megahertz. Even with manual overclocking, we only got 50 megahertz more than when we rely on the precision boost algorithm. That's a little bit underwhelming. Of course, that's in part thanks to AMD's technologies like AVFS or VAO or BTC that really push the frequency to its max out of the box. But maybe there are things that the AMD engineers didn't do that could potentially unlock higher GPU frequency. I guess we'll find out in future generations of APUs. Now, when it comes to memory tuning, wow. Spending time optimizing your memory timings will give you a significant impact on the APU's graphics performance. When I swapped out the 6400 kit for the 7800 kit and then used those memory presets to get the optimized timings, I saw the performance go up by 15 to 20%. <sighs> My mind is blown. I'm not a DDR5 overclocking expert, so I don't know exactly which timings are key here but I am looking forward to seeing all of those DDR5 experts take on the APU and lift it to 3D Mark heights we've not seen before. Anyway, 
That's it for me for today. I want to thank you for watching. And of course, I want to thank the patrons for their support. As per usual, I'll have a written version of this video up on my blog if you want to read through my bio settings or have a look at my stability test results. And if you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.